Hello, this is Nancy Ray, your host for the Rebel Haven podcast, a show designed to inspire, educate, and empower our community of entrepreneurs that think differently. For as in the words of the great and late Steve Jobs, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. I have a dream that one day, that one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Hello and welcome, my fellow rebels. This is your host, Nancy Ray Allen. And in today's podcast, we are going to be talking about how to communicate with tact so that you can actually be heard and really make the difference out there on the planet that you're wanting to make. So a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today comes from my own experience of being incredibly tact less in sharing my opinions and discussing things online and with friends and family members. So one of the first things that I want to share with you is that the way we approach discussions massively impacts how they turn out. Obviously, it is fascinating to me how often we go into conversations and debates highly, highly emotionally charged, very, very opinionated. And that energy gets us very distracted with setting a clear intention for how the conversation is going to go. We get so blinded by our own opinion, blinded by our own ambition or blinded by our own past experience that we forget about any and all um, tact, <laughs> any, any art form to the actual discussion itself. And so in addressing these things and thinking about these things, we can go out and have conversations and actually engage in a lot of the things that are happening on the planet and make a positive difference because we will approach it in a way that we're heard. So what initially turned me on to really thinking about tact was actually a conversation that took place about three weeks ago online. Now I posted about something that meant a lot to me and I posted it in such a way and at, at such inaccurate timing that it quickly, quickly resulted in some a lot of hate and anger addressed towards me. I hit a, a pain point in some people in the way that things were worded. The timing was not excellent um, considering everything that was going on in the news and the media at the time. And it's interesting that I was completely oblivious to that. I was in completely oblivious to the environment in which the words were being said. And the best way I can really describe this would be you know, we're all ignorant and we can all easily offend somebody based on context. Um, one of the examples I'm going to give is I, I have a sister who placed a baby for adoption. She had a teen pregnancy and placed a baby and it was a very intense decision for her. And there was a lot of different things around that for her. It was, it was so emotional and it, it really, um, shaped me and, helped me understand what that's like for these young moms and these young girls that get pregnant. And it, it was just a really powerful experience. And because of that experience for her, when people would joke about things, like when people get really frustrated with their kids, right. And they're like, I'm just going to put these kids up for adoption. And it's sort of a joke to her. It impacts her very differently than maybe someone else who doesn't have a story or a connection to adoption in, in any way. Right. So we can say and do things based on the environment and just being oblivious to who the audience is and who we're talking to and the conditions around what we're saying. So when we can pause and set some intentions and insert um, extra layers of tact, we can ensure that our message has the best chance of actually being heard. So one of the things I noticed when I posted, I posted in a group, about three weeks ago, this message about something that I believe, and I felt like the heart of the message was really good. The way it was delivered was, again, I told you, inappropriate timing and not very tactfully. And I had a lot of women immediately, it's, a, it's an all women's group, attacking me, like very viciously, clearly, very emotively triggered. And at the time I was so defensive. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to defend myself and defend what I'm really saying. And these are my values we're talking about. This isn't just an opinion. This is what I value. And I value this and I value, you know, whatever it is I was valuing. Okay. And one woman, um, they were attacking, attacking, attacking. And I just responded and I said, 
I feel that you're really misunderstanding my heart in what I'm trying to share here. And I said that, and it wasn't from a massively defensive stance. It was me going into the heart of what's the most rawest emotion that I could express that's the truth for me right now. And another woman joined the conversation at that time, and she responded to what I said. And she said, I do see your heart, and I understand what you're trying to share. And I think the way that you're saying it is going to alienate the very women that you're wanting to help. And I paused because the way she approached me and the way she shared that with me took me completely out of needing to defend my position and fight for and prove myself right and immediately put me into the observer's chair where I thought to myself, is this the most powerful way to share this concept with this audience? Is this going to create the best results for me? And the answer was hail to the no. (laughs) So I quickly deleted that post. And, you know, I, after I responded to this woman and just said, thank you so much, like this is very helpful. And I began to notice and study and realize how, when we become defensive, needing to defend our point of view, we completely go deaf to the other side. We lose all ability to actually listen, really hear what they're sharing. And when that happens, it's just like having two people talking to a wall and there's no point. It's a waste of energy, a waste of breath, a waste of discussion. When, when we can approach things in a way that's going to minimize the likelihood they'll get defensive. Now, we cannot control if someone's going to get defensive, of course, but there are approaches and tactful ways of engaging with them that minimize the likelihood that they will react and get defensive and shut their ears off and stop listening to us. So one of I'm going to share a couple of my tips with how to do this. One is just the energy you approach a situation in. I have come to really understand that I am ignorant and we are ignorant until we're not, right? I was ignorant before my sister's adoption process. I was ignorant to adoption. I could think about it. I could imagine it. I could try to conceptualize it, but I didn't have a knowing. I was ignorant of it until I wasn't. Again, with people that we love passing away, we are very ignorant to what it feels like for someone else to lose a parent until we do. Right? I'm incredibly ignorant to the loss of losing a child. I can only fathom and imagine it from my own position as a mom, what that would be like, but I'm ignorant to it. And when I can remember that I am inherently ignorant to anything and everything I have not yet experienced, I can approach a situation with a air of open-mindedness. I can still bring my opinion. I can still bring my experience with me to share, but I can also understand that no matter where I'm positioned in my life, there will be things I cannot see and that I'm ignorant to. And that's just the nature of me being born a female in the area I was born in the world with the color of skin I have. I am ignorant to certain things and owning and knowing that. And it's, it's an air of humility right? So confidence, I believe confidence is really knowing what you know and knowing your strengths. And I believe that humility is knowing your weaknesses, owning them fully, and also knowing that you are ignorant and accepting that there are things you're ignorant about. And in any conversation, I know 100% that I am completely ignorant to the other person's point of view. Why is that? Because I was not born in that person's body, in that person's family, in that person's home, in the city, in the world, in the economic status that they were born into. So I am 100% ignorant to their point of view, which means there is something for me to learn in the conversation. Always. Even if whatever my opinion is or whatever my decision is air quote right, I can still learn something from really shutting up and listening to this other person. Because when I hear their opinion, I am learning way more than just what their opinion is. I am learning about who they are and what they value and where they come from. And I'm also learning about people in their position that maybe disagree with me, what their true come from is. And when I can meet them where they're at, I am way more likely to be able to bridge the gap 
and enlist them and enroll them in my movement or my idea because I'm actually meeting them where they're at. If you haven't already, um, I think the third episode in the podcast is called Purple Ocean. I talk about this exact same concept in depth. I would love for you to go after this, re, you know, re-listen to that one or listen to that one for the first time because it's going to add so much perspective to what I just mentioned of being able to meet them where they're at. So when we approach a conversation, when we enter into a discussion, (laughs) remember that you can be confident and be humble simultaneously. Be confident that you know your story and your experience. You know that. That is your knowing. And you also are humble because you are completely ignorant to their come from, their story, and their experience. And when we can do that, we can approach the table with an open hand, an open hand that's willing to receive and really willing to share authentically and listen authentically. When you can approach a situation of what can I learn here? So many of the courses and motivational speeches I've listened to and and books that I've read have very similar principles that are taught, almost identical. And I remember years ago when I would hear a principle that I'd heard before, right? Like, um, you can create your life and the power of words and the power of your thoughts. I would in some way shut down to listening to it because I believed I already knew. And in that moment, that arrogance shut me off from hearing a new perspective, a new tool, a new insight, a new approach to the concept that could have massively shifted my, my game, right? My ability to kick all the ass. So when we stop and we really ask the question, what can I learn here? Even from my little people in my life, my little kids, I will approach the situation. And when I do approach the situation this way, because I don't always, of what can I learn from this? Where am I ignorant in this situation? I grow and expand so, so quickly. And that example is inspiring to people. Holding that type of space just liberates other people and gives them the permission and the role model to begin doing it the same way. So approaching it and knowing and owning your own ignorance. This will help people not be defensive immediately because they'll feel like you're listening. Another thing that will help them not be defensive is when you avoid attacking their identity. Now, attacking someone's identity is when you draw a conclusion or an assumption about who they are as a being because of what their opinion is, right? So because they believe of, you know, a certain thing about immigration or whatever the issue is, right? Because they believe that you therefore draw a conclusion that they are stupid, selfish, um, uneducated, uh, mean, evil, bad, wrong, stupid, like all of the labels that you could give a being, that is attacking their character. And the minute you do that, they become incredibly defensive because nobody wants to be ignorant and nobody wants to see themselves as mean or a jerk. That's not the goal here. They are seeing the situation very differently and their values are being defended through what they're sharing with you. And when you cannot attack them, really listen to them and in some way, find a way to validate them. I had someone post on something that I shared the other day online and I could energetically feel that they wanted to create a a motive discussion. (laughs) They wanted to argue they were sort of trolling and they shared something from a very radical, it was clearly meant to provoke, right? You've seen this. People say things in a way that they're intending to poke the beast and provoke a big uproar. And that's what this gentleman did. And I could feel that he wanted to provoke, but I could also really see his heart and what he really valued. I didn't agree with his method. His method was um, immoral, (laughs) unethical, and completely illegal, right? He was actually wanting to murder um, who he believes is the problem, right? Like, and so again, from a place of judgment and a place of really getting him to react defensively, I could attack him and be like, you're evil, you're stupid, you're wrong, you're bad, blah, blah, blah. And instead what I did was I looked at ways that I could validate this individual. And what I said was, I really appreciate and respect your desire to help with blank problem. His desire is to help eradicate 
world hunger. He wants, he, he believes, and I agree, right? In this day and age, there's no reason why we should have children around the world dying of starvation with the technology. Like we can put someone in space, we can put a human being in space and we should be able to feed our own people, right? Like we can, um, mass produce so many resources. Why in the world do we have these so many people dying every day, um, in our, in, you know, in really well-developed areas of the world, as well as third world countries that are dying of starvation. So I could feel his heart. He was wanting to, to, to really serve these people. And yeah, I think his method is going to land him in jail and be really ineffective, but maybe he wasn't saying that as an actual solution. Maybe he was trying to communicate how strongly he felt about it. He feels so strongly about it. He'd be willing to commit murder. Maybe that was what he was actually communicating to me. So in that moment of not attacking him or making him wrong or bad, where can you validate what they're trying to do? Where can you validate a compliment, really appreciate and respect what they're trying to do or what they're trying to say? So that is huge. It is huge to do that. Another thing to stop doing in these situations is assuming. And when we assume we are taking our assumptions from our own very limited experience. And again, I want to remind you that we are ignorant to their story, their life, their experience, their own way of seeing and perceiving the world. And when we assume instead of being curious, Again, we create a massive block. It's like we build a wall between us and them where we're not really listening anymore. We're assuming we're, we're listening to pass judgment rather than listening to understand. And we, you can shift your perspective and your approach to what can I understand about this person? What are they trying to share? What is their come from? It changes the entire game. So rather than assume, ask questions. If you don't understand something or you feel your own bias and assumption coming in, ask clarifying questions in a way that is kind and and genuinely wanting to know. Don't ask questions like, I'm going to work them into a corner and freaking attack. Ask questions to really understand. This, you guys, this is a game changer in the way that we engage with these really, really highly emotive, very touchy, sensitive topics. The next opportunity that we have is to remember that when we are sharing what we believe and what our solution is to share it in uh, a way that mother Teresa would. So what I mean by mother Teresa, I remember hearing a story once about people trying to get mother Teresa to come to an anti-war rally. They're like, come to this rally. Like we're marching against war. Like war is bad. No war. And she said, um, Let me know the minute you have a pro-peace rally and I will be there. And I really feel that the message and the gift in that statement is how much more powerful and effective it is to put our energy into the solution, into the new creation of peace versus into um, negating something else. So I have seen this to be powerful in any sort of conversations, interpersonal or even business to business, when we can restate our intention and state it clearly and state it from the heart of what it is that we desire. Because in that, we also assume a position of humility, which is I don't necessarily know exactly what is going to create peace, but I believe in being pro-peace instead of being anti-war. I'm going to be pro-peace. And when we can share from that space people tend to open up more to a pro. I am for this. There's a reason why these people that develop really big campaigns, we can look at pro-life versus pro-choice. There's a reason why pro-choice did not call their um, side of the issue (laughs) anti-life. Duh, right? That that would not go well, right? So, and there's a reason why pro-life did not make their side called anti-choice. What happens is it's then it becomes about weighing and measuring values. What do we value more? Do we value pro-choice more or do we value life more? And then again, that choice, it, it, it begins to shift the dialogue and the conversation to what it is that we are focusing on in that time and in that moment. So when you're in these discussions and when you feel it getting really emotive, bringing yourself back to baseline values and because I find that that's where we have the most in common with other humans. When I think about people from other parts of the world that are totally different from me and that speak a different language and have totally different religion and all of that, 
And I remember they each have a heart and they each desire love. They desire safety. They desire a home. Um, and they desire, you know, for the ones that they love to also be safe. When I can think about people that are the soldiers for the other side, that they're, um, you know, dads and brothers and moms and sisters, and that they have families at home that love them, it totally transforms what the goal is. And I really believe the goal is we all want love and safety and security. And where the argument comes in is actually how to make that happen. But when we can find what's in common, when we can see that our humanity is what we have in common, we can begin building from that foundation. And when we can begin utilizing these tools for conversing in ways that can still show respect to their own journey and process, I can still respect why somebody has the opinion that they have without agreeing with it. I can see that where they were raised and how they were raised has brought them to this particular place of belief. And that if I'm wanting them to see something in my way, I get to approach it in a loving, kind way that's respectful and in educating them. And one of the most powerful ways we can educate people is by sharing our stories. When, if someone has really mean, yucky opinions about adoption or is very judgmental or very shaming, attacking them is not going to change that, right? But if my sister were to stand up and say, I want to share with you my story and she starts talking about her experience in high school and through my parents' divorce and with different boys and boyfriends and blah, 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 and substance abuse and whatnot, you go from becoming the um, critic of her and her opinion and you become a participant in her story and you begin to understand like, oh, well, like with all of that place before her and with the belief she had about what is best for children and her experience of being raised without a dad, of course, she wanted more than anything for her baby, which she loved above anything and everything else, for it to have a mom and a dad that were secure in their relationship, that were um, be able to financially provide for this little being. And that was what she was making the number one priority because it was the number one thing she did not feel like she had. When you, when you go to that place, it immediately transforms and maybe it doesn't change your opinion totally. It doesn't, but it creates an opening. And as we can all begin to become more and more open-minded and more and more understanding, the world changes. So these are my tips, my beautiful rebels, my beautiful beings that are here with strong personalities, strong vision, strong ideas about how to revolutionize the world, that when we can approach things in this way, in a way that shows more tact and more reverence and more love overall, we truly can be heard and really make the changes that we want to make on the planet. With that being said, I want to remind you all that whatever your vision, whatever your dream, it is yes, absolutely possible. 